the Transformer architecture powers most of the impressive recent breakthroughs in AI. The Transformer is behind systems like ChatGPT, Vision Transformers, Image Generators, AlphaFold 2 for predicting protein folding and many others. So if you're interested to know about the Transformer, this is the right video for you. We already made a video explaining the Transformer, but it was one of our first videos and I can do it so much better now. Also there we did not spend enough time explaining self-attention, which we will do better this time. So here we go with the remastered explanation of the Transformer architecture. Transformers can work with any kind of data, and by that I mean text, images, speech and so on, as long as we represent the data as a set of vectors. However, it is not always straightforward to do this, as for example text does not naturally come as a sequence of vectors. That means before we can look at the inner workings of the transformers, we need to understand how to represent inputs as vectors. So let's look at two examples, text and images. For text we do the so-called tokenization, where we take a sequence of words and decompose it with the tokenizer into subwords from a predefined vocabulary, for example by following white spaces and breaking down compound words into their components. If you want to know more about tokenization, check out our previous video on this. Then the subwords all get assigned a unique vector. The vectors could be initialized randomly, or even better, with word embeddings. Word embeddings work after the idea that distances between embeddings represent word similarity. A word is defined by the company it keeps. And words that are semantically more similar are initialized with vectors close in the high dimensional vector space. You can easily download such word embeddings as they are pre-computed by counting how often words appear next to other words in text on the internet or other large corpora. And neural networks learn to assign to words similar embeddings if they both have the same neighbors. You can learn more about word embeddings in our previous video. Now that we know how to represent text, let's think how to represent images. Images are more naturally represented as vectors, or at least matrices, which are high dimensional vectors. An image is composed of three matrices where each matrix tells us for the red, green and blue channels what the light intensity of that color is in the corresponding pixel. One could take the rows of each matrix and write them one after the other to get vectors. But this would result in a lot of vectors and transformers are much slower with many vectors as will become clearer later in this video. So what people do instead is to divide images into patches and apply to each patch the same linear neural network layer that trains together with the transformer to find the right weights that sensibly change the dimensionality of p by p patches to a d times 1 matrix, which is a d-dimensional vector. To summarize, the prerequisite of transformers is that whatever the input, we must first decide for a way to represent this input with vectors. All neural networks, including the transformer, process these vectors representations into better and better representations with each layer, until the solution for the task is obvious in this final layer, or linearly separable if we want to use jargon. But compared to the other neural networks, the transformer does this processing in a specific way, as following. Let's suppose we have an input sequence here of text and the task is, for example, to predict which token comes next or whether the sentence expresses a positive or a negative sentiment or any kind of other classification task we can think of. We take our input sequence represented as vectors with word embeddings and one transformer takes in this sequence, updates the vectors and outputs as many vectors as it had in the input and preserves the dimensionality of the vectors. But to do something meaningful with these transformers, we need to add special tokens, for example, a classification token at the end of the sequence. 
This special token goes through the transformer in the same way as the other tokens do, but it is special because to its output representation, we usually append a linear classification layer that classifies from a list of words called the vocabulary, which tokens come next. And if we are trying to classify, it assigns probabilities to these classes from the classification task. And note that this is a simple classification layer, or mathematically it is just a matrix multiplication that happens here, which geometrically corresponds to drawing a separation line in the high dimensional space the word vectors live in. In other words, the solution here should be already obvious as prepared by the transformer such that we can tell fitting classes from unfitting classes just by drawing a line. During training, the transformer processes the input, gives output vectors, and we run the classification layer on the special tokens and get the assigned class. We compare the assigned prediction to the expected one from the data set, compute the loss value and backpropagate the loss value and update the internal parameters of the classification layer and the transformer layer to values that minimize the loss, thus give better classification results next time. Okay, but what happens in this mysterious box we call transformer? Well, it is composed of multiple transformer layers. <laughs> one transformer layer contains two things. One of them is not so much, it is just the same feedforward network, also called MLP sublayer, acting on every input token. Such an MLP sublayer takes the input representation, applies a dense layer with jelu activation that doubles the dimension. Then another dense layer with jelu activation scales down the dimension again. And it is the same MLP layer with the exact same weights we apply to each input token embedding. Okay, let's see what we have. A bunch of MLP layers processing each token independently of the others. This is suboptimal because see this word representation? Well, it does not even know that there are other words next to it. And it's even worse for the classification token that should aggregate and summarize the sentence information if we are to use it for classification. But it has no connection to the sentence tokens at all. While the transformer layer saves a lot of compute time because all of these MLP layers compute their output in parallel, we need a way to communicate information in the context of the sequence, so that the word works is informed of the existence and semantics of its neighbor attention, for example. Luckily, this is what the self-attention layer is for to let information flow within the context of the sequence from one embedding to its neighbors. In a nutshell, the attention layer computes how much of the representation of each of all neighbors we need to add to compute a new token representation, which is the outcome of the self-attention layer. By the way, we will be using attention and self-attention here synonymously. But if you're wondering what the difference between them is, Self-attention is when we compute importances of the elements of a sequence with respect to the elements in the same sequence. Attention is more general because we compute the importance of the elements of one sequence to the elements in another sequence. For example, you can see here the self-attention of it on the left and the attention of in on the right. In is an element from a sequence different to the one above it. Now, how does the attention layer compute these importances exactly? Well, it is a bit complicated in the sense that it is a pile of linear algebra that uses the loss function to adapt the entries of weight matrices during training to make them work well in inference. But neural networks are never anything else other than huge piles of linear algebra, so strap yourself onto your chair because we will try to explain the attention computation as clear as possible. Self-attention does the following. It takes the input vectors and applies three different linear transformation to produce the keys, queries and value vectors. This means that for the queries, it multiplies the query matrix to the input vector and this results in a query vector. This query matrix is randomly initialized before training and gradient descent adapts its values during backpropagation to make them the right ones that reduce the loss on the training data. And the same query matrix applies to all inputs to get query vectors for all of them. 
As for the keys, we simply have another matrix called the key matrix, which is differently initialized from the query matrix that also multiplies to the input vector to produce a key vector. And to produce the value vectors, we multiply a value matrix to the input. So in summary, we have three different matrices, all initialized randomly, that linearly transform the input in different ways. Now, what is self-attention further doing to these different vectors it has just produced? Let's suppose we are calculating the attention for the input token works to all other tokens in the sequence, including itself. It works the same for the other tokens too, but we will just show it for works. First, we compute the scalar product between the query vector of the token of interest and the keys of every other vector. Then we divide by the square root of the dimension of the key vectors, so square root of 3. Then we apply the softmax over all these values. We can interpret these softmax scores to be measuring how important each token in the input is for the token works. So the token attention is 13% important for works, works is 78% important to itself, and the CLS token is 7% important. Now, it gets interesting. To get the final representation of works, we take the sum over all value vectors weighted or multiplied with the softmax result. So this is what we meant before by saying the attention combines the representation of the input the value vectors weighted by the importance score. Empirically, it turns out that one set of attention values in each layer is not enough to capture the complexity of relationships in our data. Think of it this way. The attention importance scores define a graph where it tells us for each token of how important it is to all other tokens. But one graph is not enough to model all existing relationships. In the same way, you can define your social network graph based on how many friends you have, but you can also think of other types of connections, like with whom of these people you work together, or with whom you share the same city. There are multiple relationships and importances to be modeled given a set of tokens. Therefore, the idea of multi-head attention is to let the network learn three or eight or 12 attention patterns instead of just one. So we do not use just one set of query key and value matrices, but three of them, and each set is called an attention head. As we initialize the key query and value matrices all randomly, they will start with different values in their training process, will produce different query vectors, and they will usually capture different patterns that they detect in your data. One head might focus on one pattern, such as coreference resolution, and another one on identifying the subject in sentences. If you wonder how many attention heads you need, the answer is that you are free to choose. It is a hyperparameter. The more the better, but often you cannot use very many as you quickly run out of GPU memory. Especially because attention scales quadratically in time and memory. So if you process a sequence that doubles the size, you will need four times as much time to run and four times as much memory. It is an active area of research to approximate attention with other operations that scale linearly instead of quadratically, or to replace it altogether with other operations that do the job of mixing information between tokens. If you're interested in this topic, please watch our previous videos on this. But in a nutshell, it's fake news that attention is all you need. You can replace it with other token mixing procedures too. Now re let's recap what we have so far and what we still need for a full transformer. We have our input embeddings. They go through the self-attention layer that gives us representations that are informed on the fellow embeddings in the sequence. Then they go through the MLP layer all in parallel. But so far, this transformer layer behaves like our input sequence weren't a sequence, but a set. If we were to reorder the tokens, the transformer would not change its outputs. The results of the attention would be still the same, as all operations there are commutative. Please check to convince yourself. And the feedforward network acts independently of all the other tokens anyway. This is not great at. So far, the transformer gives us the same output independently of the order of the input because images, text, and sound are sequences where order matters. We need a way to tell the transformer layer that this is the first token in the sequence, and this is the second, and so on. 
And this is what positional embeddings do. They are vectors that uniquely identify each position, and we add these vectors to the input embeddings. They work like house numbers to identify the specific position of each house in a street address. How do we come up with the values for position embeddings? Well, with certain rules, or we can simply learn these vectors as well during the training process of the transformer. If you want more details about positional embeddings and the numerous ways to implement them, you can watch one of our previous videos on this. Okay, now that we got this figured out, there is one more thing missing and the architecture is complete. The missing ingredient are the residual connections, which after the self-attention layer add the input of the self-attention layer to its output. A normalization operation reduces the values back again to the 0 to 1 range after the sum, because otherwise, after each residual connection with each layer, the values would get larger and larger and larger. And the same thing of adding the input back to the output happens around the MLP layer here in green. The intuition behind residual connections is to make the learning job easier for each layer. To arrive at the solution, the network needs to transform the inputs, but since it is allowed to keep the input through the residual connections, each layer is forced to learn not the whole transformation, but just the difference it needs to add to arrive at the output. It's kind of breaking down the problem a bit. And residual connections become even more important as usually with deep neural networks. We usually do not just use one transformer layer, but append another transformer layer to the output of the previous one and another layer and so on. How many? It's a hyperparameter. And of course we are limited by the amount of memory our GPUs have. The more the better, because the transformer gets more attempts to break down the problem and arrive at a solution, which is easier than getting uh, the solution in one go with just one layer. And residual connections also help when training such a long stack of layers, because during backpropagation, gradient signals can get lost by propagating from the end to the beginning, very much like a whisper in the telephone game. Now, this is most of what you need to know about transformer basics, since you now know the principles after which they predict the next word, like GPT, or classify the whole sequence. Another training procedure we left for the end is the so-called masked language modeling procedure used for transformers of the bird family. There we have a classifier token that we use to classify whether two sentences belong together or not, but there's more. 15% of tokens in the sequence are chosen randomly and masked out and replaced with a special mask token. The training objective of BERT is then to adapt its weights such that a linear mask classification head can choose from the vocabulary the word that we masked out in the input. This mask language modeling procedure is great to train classification transformers or so-called transformer encoders. Predicting the next word is something for GPT-like models, so for transformer decoders. And if you're wondering what the difference between transformers and recurrent neural networks is, then let's look at this simplified view. While in transformers we use attention to communicate information in parallel from each input token to every other token, RNNs process the first token and use that output as input together with the second token to process the second token. Then the output of the second token goes into the processing of the third token and so on. And you see the problem that we need to wait for the second token to finish processing so we can start computing the third token. This means that RNNs train slower than transformers. So when transformers revolutionize NLP, it's because their architecture allowed them to read the entire internet because they could process tokens in parallel. While with RNNs, nobody got to train onto the whole internet because it took so much time. We hope you liked this little introduction to the transformer architecture and that you can impress your friends and family that you now know how ChatGPT works internally. And there are countless of other great resources on this topic, such as the Illustrated Transformer blog post by Jay Alamar and the Transformer series of Luis Serrano. Also, I hope that my Patreon supporters that voted for the Transformer Explained video as a topic for the next video will be happy as I finally managed to finish this video. I really thank them for their patience. <laughs>
If you like this video, do not forget to like and subscribe. And we hope to see you next time. Okay, bye. Thank you.